Welcome to Curatorial Clips, short videos by the curators at the Freeland Museum of Art and faculty colleagues on works in the collection in areas of our expertise. I'm Jordan Love, I use the pronouns she, her, and I'm the Carol R. Engel Academic Curator at the Freeland. The Freeland Museum and the University of Virginia stand on the territory and homelands of the Monacan Nation. Today in this curatorial clip, I'm going to talk about our sculpture of St. Sebastian. St. Sebastian was a third century saint during the reign of the Emperor Diocletian. The details of his life and martyrdom first appeared in a fifth century text, the Passio Sancti Sebastiani, originally attributed to St. Ambrose, but more recently thought to be by an unknown later author. The text recounts that Sebastian was a Roman soldier of the elite Praetorian Guard, who kept his conversion to Christianity a secret. His religious beliefs were ultimately discovered, and it was ordered that he be shot to death by the imperial archers. His body was left in a field where he was discovered and miraculously nursed back to health by St. Irene of Rome. He later was martyred when he publicly called out Emperor Diocletian and was subsequently beaten to death and dumped in the Roman sewer. This latter part of his martyrdom is rarely depicted. What we see here is the most commonly depicted scene of his story, when he has just been shot by arrows. He has been tied to a tree and we can see rope around his wrists and arrow holes in his body. These holes would likely originally have held arrows made out of either wood or metal that was later removed. We hope in the future that a conservator may find traces of either of these substances inside these holes to provide a clue as to what these arrows may have looked like. Our sculpture of St. Sebastian comes originally from the area of Burgundy in eastern France. There had long been a sculptural tradition in that area of France, and here you see two tympanums on famous churches in the area dating from the 12th century to really demonstrate what this tradition was all about. The one on the left is the central narthex portal at Vézelay at the Basilica of Saint-Marie-Madeleine, dated to about 1140 to 1150. And the similar one on the right is the portal at the Cathedral of Saint-Lazare in Autun, depicting the Last Judgment, also from that time period. The one on the right is one of the first examples of an actual signed sculpture we learn from a band below Christ's feet and a band of sculpture around Christ himself that labels this sculpture by the artist Gislibertus. So where would St. Sebastian have been located inside a church in Burgundy, France? Well, sculpture was frequently attached to the cathedral on the exterior of the front portal usually on either side of the entrance. These were known as jam figures, and here are some examples at the Cathedral of Amiens in northeastern France. They were also located inside the cathedral, usually in side chapels or attached to columns. The reason we know the Freyland St. Sebastian was from Burgundy in the 15th century is due to the fact that he displays the characteristics of the sculpting workshops of that region and time period. On the right is another sculpture from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York from that same location and time period. Notice how St. Barbara has the same almond-shaped eyes, delicate features, and a style of curly hair common to sculptures from the Burgundian workshops. Both figures are less than life size, displaying short, squat bodies. While little emphasis is placed on the musculature of St. Sebastian, St. Barbara, on the other hand, has a carefully sculpted display of drapery across her body. This demonstrates that during this time, while the Renaissance in Italy was fomenting an interest in the human body, the Burgundian sculptors were not yet embracing that pursuit and were instead 
focused on the visual effects of sculpted drapery, more common in paintings and sculpture of the Netherlands. This is explained by the fact that the workshops were frequently funded by the Dukes of Burgundy and the House of Valois, including Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, Philip the Good, and Charles the Bold. St. Sebastian's role was as an intercessor on behalf of plague victims. Before the Black Plague of 1348 to 1350, which wiped out one third to one half of Europe, St. Sebastian was rarely depicted in art. Modern scholars have speculated that Sebastian's arrow wounds resembled the swollen glands or buboes associated with bubonic plague. His miraculous recovery from the brink of death must have been a source of hope and consolation to those living through that dark time. Early Christian writers believed that plague was a form of divine punishment and that the only solution was to do acts of penance, participate in processions, and to pray to the saints to act on mankind's behalf. So Saint Sebastian became the patron saint of plague victims. This painting from the Walters Art Museum displays exactly what Sebastian was hoped to do. Pray to God for mankind's deliverance from disease and for the souls of those who had, were departed. The timeliness of this painting to our current pandemic cannot be missed. Here, Netherlandish painter Joost Lieferinks depicts a historic plague, that of Pavia in 680, but in a modern 15th century setting. Viewers would have known the horrors of plague firsthand. Joost depicts cartloads of bodies being brought out of a city for mass burial. A grave worker is suddenly struck down with sickness. A processional cross is held in the background and the image of St. Sebastian appears in the sky kneeling and praying before God while an angel and devil battle for the soul of a body below. The image that we just saw referred to the 680 plague of Pavia. Coincidentally, the first writing linking St. Sebastian to plague was an 8th century account of that very plague of 680. The author, Paulus Diaconus, in his work History of the Lombards, recounts that divine revelation indicated that the plague would not cease until an altar was erected in honor of St. Sebastian in the Roman Basilica of St. Peter in Chains, also known as San Pietro in Vincoli. The image on the left is a mosaic of St. Sebastian in that very church and is thought to date from that time. Early Christian basilicas typically depicted Christ and the saints in mosaic form, depicted in layers of drapery as older clothed men, not in the moment of their martyrdom, but in the glorious realm of heaven. The mosaic medium and nature of their rendering reflect the influence of both ancient Roman and Byzantine art traditions. However, this is one of the few depictions of St. Sebastian prior to the Black Death of 1348. After that devastating plague, demand for images of Sebastian exploded, and his association with plague was permanently established. This key early mosaic did have an influence on some later artists. The work on the right is by Raphael, showing Sebastian clothed and in his role as heavenly intercessor holding an arrow as an attribute that helps us to identify him. However, the signs of the humanistic Renaissance are also before us. Raphael renders the saint not as a wizened elder, but as an idealized young man, reflecting his age at his martyrdom and his status as a Roman soldier in the prime of life. Our St. Sebastian sculpture reflects the quickly developing trend in the 15th century to depict the saint at the moment just after he was shot with arrows. It was this key point in the narrative 
that reflects the miracle of his story and the most important moment for the viewer, his survival. It also clearly echoed for viewers the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of his body, which likely accounts for St. Sebastian's depiction nude. However, it was also the Renaissance new interest in the idealized human body and the study of classical nude sculpture that affected how St. Sebastian came to be rendered in art. Some of the Renaissance's most famous artists depicted St. Sebastian, often commissioned multiple times to depict the saint. Here on the left is a painting by Andrea Mantegna, now in the Louvre, that idealizes the saint's body and places it within a classical architectural landscape. He is tied not to a tree, as seen as in the Fralin example, but to a classical column. The drawing on the right is by Raphael, also now in the Louvre and shows that Raphael was also experimenting with the nude version of St. Sebastian. Here, he is depicted with other popular plague saints, the Virgin Mary in the center and St. Roch on the right, a plague trinity of saints that became a common formulaic depiction. While St. Sebastian was a historical saint, St. Roch was a newcomer, said to have lived during the Black Plague. According to the Golden Legend, a compilation of the lives of the saints, St. Roch was the son of a nobleman in Montpellier, France. As a young man, he gave away all his worldly goods and set out on a pilgrimage to Rome during an epidemic of plague, tending to the sick on his way and performing miraculous acts of healing. He eventually fell ill in the town of Piacenza and was sent away for quarantine in the woods. The miracle of his healing from plague occurred when a faithful dog brought him food and licked his sores, causing them to vanish. He was later martyred in prison. St. Sebastian and St. Rock became bookend plague saints for those suffering from plague. One was old and linked to Christ, and one was new and linked to recent events. The plague returned frequently, often annually, though it did not become as widespread a pandemic as it had between 1348 and 1350. Port cities on the Italian peninsula and wider Mediterranean trading network were frequently hit with recurrences of bubonic plague throughout the 15th through the early 19th century. Thus, depictions of St. Sebastian were never out of fashion. In the Baroque period, such noted and varied artists as El Greco and Peter Paul Rubens addressed the subject. On the left, El Greco echoed the traditions set forth by the earlier Renaissance painters. He, Saint Sebastian is depicted tied to a tree in a dramatic dark landscape, typical of the Baroque period. Rubens, on the other hand, on the right, demonstrates the Netherlandish penchant for surfaces and textures. Rubens shows off his virtuosity by including St. Sebastian's shiny soldier's armor and the fluffy wings of angels who come to heal his wounds. Though he follows the classical contrapposto stance of the Renaissance painters who imitated classical sculpture, El Greco has hidden St. Sebastian's arms and elongated his body, distorting it. Rubens, however, accentuates the muscles and twists the torso, as if calling to mind the sculpture of Michelangelo. Finally, Saint Sebastian was so prevalent in visual culture that small images of him are even found in manuscripts and early printed books. This late 15th century page from a French book of hours, also owned by the Freyland Museum of Art, was created around the same time as our sculpture, not long after the Gutenberg press was invented around 1450, and includes hand-painted capital letters throughout the text, as well as a border of printed images depicting saints and biblical scenes. In the upper left, we see a familiar image of Saint Sebastian tied to a tree shot with arrows, while an archer stands to the right, 
bow in hand. The Latin text on this leaf, front and back, are Psalm 147, Ecclesiastes 24, and the hymn Ave Maria. Saint Sebastian was so fundamental to the spiritual lives of medieval and Renaissance people that they could now carry him with them. I hope you've enjoyed this journey with me exploring the Saint Sebastian sculpture at the Freyland Museum of Art and its place in the larger world of the art of plague. Please join us again soon for our next curatorial clip.